This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the stockbroker clerked, Lady Frances Carfax disappeared, and Bruce Partington planned. But there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever wondered what a commissionaire does? Or what a compositor is? Or of the difference between a Steve Dorr and a Stoker? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 220, Mongoose. Well, hello, and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast, where we look into the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, uh, well, I don't even know how to begin th- this episode, because mongoose, it- it's not something that comes up every year. <laughs> I was going to say every day, but that's not even even close. Um, so this should be a rare and collectible episode. Well, all of our episodes are rare and collectible, but um, unfortunately, I don't have a mongoose, so we're going to have to talk about your goose. (laughs) Well, we will do that right after we remind you that this show is available at ihose.co slash trifles220, all lowercase. That'll bring you directly to the show notes for this episode. Any links that we have or things that we discuss that need more clarification or edification, you will find there. You can also find links to our presence on social media, where we are I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, which, of course, is a nod to our main program, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, our twice-a-month podcast where we talk to interesting people in the world of Sherlock Holmes and do interviews with them. Be sure to check out the latest, which is all about Arthur Conan Doyle. And, of course... At those show notes, you can figure out how to support the show, whether you'd like to leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast catcher of choice, or whether you'd like to support the show monetarily for as little as a dollar a month. It helps keep the lights and the microphones on here, and it helps us to bring interesting content your way. Well, let's bring some interesting content by the way of... Rare Animals. This, of course, is the third episode of the month. And in 2021, what we're doing in the third episode of every month is we're looking at rare animals. Of course, you know, we've talked about pets and common things like cats, dogs, etc. So we are looking at more of the rarities in the animal world. The last episode we did in this series in February uh, concerned the cheetah and baboon, uh, that, that animal of the month club that uh, Dr. Roylott seemed to belong to, where he would get uh, rare animals sent to him on a regular basis. Now, Bert, in this case, uh, this is not an animal of the month club. This is really kind of a a rare animal for life uh, that we're talking about, the mongoose. Where do we come across a mongoose in the Sherlock Holmes canon? What story would we find that in? Well, uh, before before we get there, I just wanted to mention that, you know, there is sort of a cultural anchor for this. Um, you know, in the 19th century, you know, which might be vaguely interesting to our listeners, in the 19th century, Victorians started to place more emphasis on domesticity and the home, and uh, pets were a key part of that. Mm. And there are a lot of Victorian paintings that show pets to be a part of the family. And then, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, Children were encouraged to keep small animals like rabbits and guinea pigs. And then there were always pedigreed dogs and things that conveyed social status. But um, nobody paid too much attention to the fact that you could do a harm 
to animals by taking them um, <laughs> out of their natural habitat. And so, um, you know, it's sort of in that context, this sort of uh, Victorian era attraction towards pets and not being too sensitive to what happens when you take them out of their natural habitat. Is, is, that, we that, find- is that maybe the... Um- Maybe that was the conservatory nature of Edward Rucastle, that he felt bad for the roaches that were trapped at the Copper Beaches, and he just put them out of their misery with a smack, smack, smack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a future entomologist. He was a future entomologist. <laughs> oh, I think that's uh, I think that's very funny. Well, you know... There is some context there because cats, of course, caught mice and rabbits. You know, you, if you were a Victorian farmer and so on, rabbits could be eaten, you know, when, when times get hard. Um, you know, and there were um, animals that you would you would um, keep. I don't quite remember which one, but I remember, I think it was at the Leadenhall Market that um, they had hedgehogs oh, wow. that were available for sale and, and – uh, the advantage is that if you had a hedgehog in your kitchen, it would eat beetles. And that was sort of an early, uh, you know, an early, really? uh, yeah, pe- an early pest control. I thought method. the beetles weren't popular until the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it was a lot longer. Look, they were playing in Liverpool months, years before. They had to, they had to get away from the hedgehog to really make it big. Well, the big news for them was getting out of the kitchen. You know, their <laughs> life improved. <laughs> A lot when when they got out of the kitchen. Well, but in the crooked in the crooked man, we famously find Teddy, the mongoose. Mm. And, and it's that, interesting if you look at the later history. You know, I just sort of found this when I was when I was glancing around. But apparently, in the early 1930s, there was a big story in Britain about the Dalby Spook or the talking mongoose, and there was a family that had a farmhouse. And uh, it was near the hamlet of Dalby on the Isle of Man. And the press made a big deal out of this. And there were parapsychologists and ghost hunters to to went and and tried to investigate the talking mongoose. And they concluded (laughs) that the the little girl in the house may have been a ventriloquist. So there was was a... There was a big paper here called Clue to the Mystery of Talk of Talking Weasel in the newspaper. And the subhead was Schoolgirl May have powers of ventriloquism from our own reporter. <laughs> Let me out of here. <laughs> you know, it's, ah, Char- ah, it's, Charlie. it's always the little girls, isn't it? They're the ones who yeah. came up with the Cottingley fairies. Right. And, and, right. and Britons of the late 1920s, early 1930s seem to have been uh, duped quite easily. Very gullible yeah. people. Yes, Gullible's yes. travels, I guess. <laughs> well, you see, we were born too late. Can you imagine what wealth <laughs> we would have wandering around to newspapers like the Times and the Daily Express, giving them the good news about podcasts? <laughs> see, all you have to do is record it on this wax cylinder. There you go. <laughs> oh, well, they were the they were the conspiracy theorists of their time. Yes. Well, uh, certainly not a conspiracy, but it was definitely an oddity uh, in The Crooked Man. When Holmes and Watson uh, visited uh, the scene of the crime, they they said, uh, Holmes said there there had been a man in the room and he had crossed the lawn coming from the road. I was able to obtain five very clear impressions of his footmarks, one in the roadway itself at the point where he had climbed the low wall, two on the lawn, two very faint ones upon the stained boards near the window where he had entered. He apparently rushed across the lawn, for his toe marks were much deeper than the heels. But it was not the man who surprised me. It was his companion. His companion? Holmes pulled a large sheet of tissue paper out of his pocket and carefully unfolded it upon his knee. What do you make of that? he asked. The paper was covered in the tracings of footmarks of some small animal. It had five well-marked footpads an indication of long nails, and the whole print might have been nearly as large as a dessert spoon. It is a dog, said I. Did you ever have a dog running up a curtain? I found distinct traces that this creature had done so. A monkey, then? 
It is certainly not the print of a monkey. What can it be? Neither a dog, nor a cat, nor monkey, nor any creature we are familiar with. I've tried to reconstruct it from the measurements. Here are four prints where the beast has been standing motionless. You see that it is no less than fifteen inches from four foot to hind. Add to that length of neck and head, and you get a creature much, not much less than two feet long, probably more, if there's any tail. But now, observe this other measurement. The animal has been moving, and we have the length of its stride. In each case, it's only about three inches. You have an indication, you see, of a long body with very short legs attached to it. It's not been considerate enough to leave any of its hair behind it. But its general shape must be what I have indicated, and it can run up a curtain, and it is carnivorous. Sounds like a a zombie corgi. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's it's interesting. We hadn't really thought about this, but, um, you know, if you look around, there are echoes of the mongoose that pop up in, in some interesting places beyond, um, you know, the crooked man and, and poor Colonel uh, Henry Wood. Mm. Um, for example, uh, Rudyard Kipling, you know, wrote the Jungle Book, which I think uh, was not a 20th century. I think it came out in the 1890s. And no. of course, in the Jungle Book, there's a story about Ricky Tiki Tavi. And I think Ricky Tiki Tavi was a mongoose. And then if you zoom all the way forward, to uh, the late 20th century, you've got the Lion King. And in the Lion King, you've got, from Disney, you've got uh, Timon and Pumbaa. And Timon, uh, you know, was a mongoose. So, was he? Uh, yeah, sure, I think. I thought he I was think. a, um, I thought he was a meerkat. Wasn't that the same thing? Isn't that kind of like being a mongoose? <laughs> Isn't that being a cousin? Aren't meerkats cousins of mong of they, mongai? They, What's the plural of mongoose? They is are. It they are. It's a small mongoose. That's what it is. Oh, uh, really? And, yes, they are found in mm. and only in Africa. Uh, whereas mong is it mongoose or mon- <laughs> mongooses? I don't, I don't even know. You know, it would be a fleck of mongoose, it's not a flock, just a fleck. The fleck and you know, the reason why it's a fleck is because they move so quickly. I just saw a fleck of mongoose. They, they, they just flick right by. A flick, I flicked yeah. a fleck of mongoose. Uh, well, yeah. you know what? Let's <laughs> let's keep debating this, but let's do it after this quick word from our sponsor. In 2021, the BSI Press features three new volumes. That's right. Three volumes, including one from the Manuscript Series, one from the profession Series, and one dedicated to the outgoing head of the BSI. First, the Manuscript Series, you'll hear about the Staunton Tragedy, that is, the missing three-quarter. Mike Whalen, the former head of the BSI, has edited this book, in which a number of authors take aim at the missing three-quarter. You'll learn about rugby. You'll learn about the mystery. You'll learn about, well, many things in the latest manuscript series. And in the latest profession series, Michael Quigley and Marsha Pollock edit this volume that brings together corporals, colonels, and commissionaires as they look at military in the canon. And the third volume is A Quiet Air of Mastery, Essays in Honor of Mike Whalen as he steps down as the head of the Baker Street Irregulars. And that's edited by Les Klinger. All of these and more are available at bakerstreetirregulars.com under the BSI Press section. Be sure to pick up your copy today. All right, we're back talking about mongoose. And that's plural or singular. Take it every, uh, whichever way you want. Um, so, Bert, you mentioned uh, the meerkat, uh, which is a small mongoose that appeared in The Lion King. We did skip over one bit of literature, and it's it's a rather obscure one, uh, where a mongoose is also featured. And it will take us directly back to Teddy in The Crooked Man. Um, a mongoose is featured in Bram Stoker's novel, The Lair of the White Worm. Uh, in it, the main character, who's uh, Adam Salton, he purchases a mongoose uh, to uh, take care of 
some black snakes that he finds on his great uncle's property. So he buys a mongoose to hunt them down. And um, he had discovered a child that had been bitten on the neck by a snake and learned that another child had already been killed by a snake bite. So an interesting kind of crossover there with Bram Stoker's other neck-biting villain in uh, in Dracula. Although I don't think a mongoose would work against vampires, as far as I'm aware. Well, I'll be darned. I've never read that book, which apparently was published right before Stoker died. How interesting. And it says that the story is based on the legend of the Lambton Worm. Hmm. Um, which I've never heard of either. So, well, that's great. That's a lovely tip for something more to... Uh, to to dig into how interesting yeah hmm. well and and we know from when holmes and watson finally do uh, encounter henry wood um he he is a conjurer he's known to the local uh, citizens the local uh soldiers there that see him around the uh, the camp uh, around the uh, the base and um they they uh, they see teddy come out of a basket and uh, and and Watson said it's a mongoose, and uh, Wood says, oh, "Well, some call them that. Some call them the ichnumenon. Uh snake catcher is what I call them." And Teddy is amazing quick on cobras. So interesting, hmm. um, uh, interesting uh, role there that Teddy plays in its in his uh, his performance with uh with henry wood you know according to um wikipedia mongooses there we go are a common spectacle at roadside shows in pakistan snake charmers keep mongooses for mock fights with snakes how interesting you know i mean i read that obviously and i never looked it up but Looking online, you know, which is the source, of course, of all true information. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, apparently, there, mo the mongoose has a specialized acetylcholine receptor that renders it immune to venom. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Well, there you go. Hmm. So uh, clearly, I uh, Teddy was was there as a companion of Henry Wood and also as, uh, you know, part of his, uh, his sideshow there where he entertained the troops and, you know, people found him at the pub and, uh, you know, just, just doing his thing, uh, performing magic and snake charming evidently as part of his <laughs> regular features. So, you know, catch the matinee with Henry Wood and Teddy. Um, that would be amazing. Wouldn't it? If Henry Wood put Teddy up on his lap and did the ventriloquism bit with him. <laughs> That's right. The speaking mongoose. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Teddy. <laughs> ah, Teddy, Teddy. <laughs> you're such a <laughs> you're such a challenge to me sometimes, Teddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Well, you don't look well today at all, Henry, you know. Whoa. Tough night. <laughs> <laughs> So before we wrap up here, I suppose since we did talk, uh, promise people that we would talk about uh, mongooses during this episode, we owe them a little bit about uh, the, the beast, more than what we find in the canon. Mongooses have uh, long faces and bodies, small rounded ears, short legs, tapering tails. We know that. Most are brindled or grizzly. A few have strongly, coat, strongly marked coats, which bear a striking resemblance to mustelids. Uh, Non-retractile claws that are used primarily for digging. Uh, they have uh, narrow ovular pupils, uh, a large uh, anal scent gland used for territorial marking and signaling reproductive status. And um, they are one of at least four known mammalia taxa with mutations in that acetylene, uh, acetylcholine receptor that you say that protect against snake venom. Uh, they are typically found in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the lower parts of Asia which is, of course, where we found uh, Henry Wood having recovered from his, uh, his, his ambush there uh, during the war. And 
the uh, the species, uh, there's an Egyptian mongoose, which is uh, Herpestes uh, ichneumonon. Uh, yeah, I think that's right, ichneumonon. Um, ichneumon, ichneumon. Um, that is one uh, uh, branch we can find. The other is uh, the genus uh, ichneumia, which is a white-tailed mongoose, uh, typically found... Uh, in, uh, gosh, Senegal. So, you know, very, very likely that these are the areas where Henry Wood would have traveled and, and picked up the, uh, not only the animal, but the culture of uh, using the animal as a, a snake charmer as well. It's a wonderful thing that in the cases of Sherlock Holmes, you can find characters that are so beautifully drawn as Henry Wood. And so interestingly paired with a character like Teddy the Mongoose, you know, who just introduces this otherworldly, strange uh, aspect to the case that just makes everything, you know, all that more interesting. I mean, look, you know, say what you will, Hercule Poirot, uh, Martin Hewitt, you know, the other detectives of that era, um, nobody ever was investigating a case where you would come across a mongoose or some of these other, some of the other creatures that uh, had formed bonds with humans and were part of some larger interesting story. Very true. Stoats, goats, shoats, ostriches, giraffes, gazelles, and many more that are just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Our intruder had a somewhat unusual companion. It's a dog, isn't it? Somebody's dog. Who ever heard of a dog running up a curtain? What about a cat, then? These paw marks are not those of a cat, not of a monkey, nor of any creature that we are familiar with. I would think from hind foot to fore foot, at least 15 inches out of that, the length of neck and head, you have a creature of... No less than two feet. More if there's a tail. The length of its stride is odd. It indicates a creature with a long back and short legs. Something like a stoat or a weasel? We also know that it is carnivorous. How can you tell that? Well, you see, what made it run up the curtain? The canary. Exactly. And what was this beast? <laughs>